So I'm really excited for lecture 15B here. I think it involves some really cool stuff. A was pretty technical, kind of hard to follow all those calculations without actually taking the time to double check them. Lecture B is going to be more conceptual, and I think it's a cool kind of conceptual. It's one of my favorite parts of calculus. First, let's review something we already know. We've already learned about differentiability. F is said to be differentiable at x equals a if the derivative of f prime of a exists. I did mention this on Monday. There's an implicit assumption behind the scenes here. F must be defined at least near a as well. We can't just like define at a and nowhere else. <coughs> assumption f is defined in some little interval around a. Differentiable functions are necessarily continuous. If you know the function is differentiable, it must be continuous. Therefore, if it's not continuous, it's also not differentiable. Why? Let's go through the proof, or an outline of the proof at least. Let's consider this limit here. The limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a. You might wonder why are we considering this limit? The answer will be clear at the end, hopefully. Through a little bit of trickery, multiplying by a disguised form of 1, in this case, x minus a over x minus a, we can say this is true. These two the things are the same. This is the same as this, as long as x is not equal to a. But remember, with the limit definition, epsilons and deltas, it doesn't matter what happens when x is a, so we can certainly write this. Does that make sense? We're just modifying the function by multiplying by x minus a over x minus a, which doesn't change the value as long as x is not equal to a. And, well, the limit of a product is the product of limits. That's a property of limits. It's not a linearity property, because linearity only has to do with multiplying functions by constants and then adding them. Here we're multiplying two functions, this function and that function. But I did mention this, the limit of a product is the product of the corresponding limits. I mentioned it maybe five or six lectures ago. That's what I'm using. I'm implicitly assuming these limits exist. Certainly this one exists. It equals zero, in fact, right? As x approaches a, x minus a is going to approach zero. Does this limit exist? It does, actually, because it actually equals the derivative. It does? Really? I thought the definition of the derivative was involved h, or at least a, a delta x or something. Wouldn't f prime of a here be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h? Sure. But this limit and that limit right here are the same. Why? They don't look the same. It's essentially just a, what's called a change of variables. Um, if you let x equal a plus h, So h then also equals x minus a. As h goes to 0, x goes to a, right? Look at this equation here, or this one. If h is going to 0, that means x minus a is going to 0. x must be approaching a. You can think about it this way, too. If h is going to 0, if that term is going to 0, then x must be getting closer and closer to a. And so based on this little tri trickery here, h going to 0 is equivalent to x going to a. I can replace a plus h there with an x. <coughs> and I can replace the h here with x minus a. And that's the exact same limit as on the slide. Just a little bit of trickery in a picture. On another line, really A is here, X is here, and H is here. There's a visual for why H equals X minus A. 
It also helps explain why x equals a plus h. Start of a and m, each one you get to x. As h goes to zero, that's equivalent to x going to a. This is a slope of a secant line right there. It's the limit as x goes to a is the slope of the tangent. But this limit is zero, so zero times f prime of a is zero. So what have we really proved? We've really proved this limit is zero, and that fact is actually equivalent to this fact, which was the, essentially the definition of continuity. You can evaluate the limit of the function by plugging in a. That's the definition of continuity. This being true is really equivalent to this limit being zero. I hope that makes an intuitive sense. Essentially, it's like you're just adding f of a to both sides. There's one step in between, but essentially it's not different. <clears throat> Differentiable functions are also locally linear. What does that mean? It means the graphs appear straighter and straighter the closer you zoom in to the given point. It also means the tangent line approximation or linear approximation is good. This approximation is good when x is close to a. Now, the word good is kind of a vague term in math, right? What does it mean for something to be good in math? Well, you might be thinking good grade. Good approximation, what does that mean exactly? We'll talk more about that on Friday. Another way to rewrite this approximation is this one. Essentially, to get from here to here, just subtract f of a from both sides. f of x minus f of a is the change in y. And on the right side, you'd be left with that. And x minus a is the same as h or delta x. h and delta, delta x mean the same. Okay. Let's use Mathematica for a few minutes to illustrate these ideas visually. Here is a graph of the absolute value function. A, B, S of X. It's got a corner, it seems, at the origin. Is it really a corner? Zoom in to check. No matter how far you zoom in, it still looks like a corner. And that would happen even if I went even closer. Be careful though, like in the homework problem with this function, square root of x squared plus 0 0.0001, on a large scale view, it looks like it's got a corner at zero. But if you zoom in toward the origin here, you get close enough and all of a sudden that corner goes away. Look at that. There's not really a corner there. It doesn't look like there was one. Graphs can be deceiving if you're not careful. By going all the way, I don't even see the graph anymore. I made an adjustment in this next animation to allow us to still see the graph. I'm not going to zoom in on the origin this, this time. I'm going to zoom in on the bottom, the lowest point there. So here we still see the graph. The derivative at zero is zero. It is differentiable. It looks more and more like a straight line, closer to zoom in. What about this one? Can you see that? f of x equals x times sine of one over x when x is not zero and zero otherwise. I think this may have been one of your homework problems as well. Zoom in on this one, what do you see? You see a pretty wild graph here. There's infinitely many oscillations. You remember the sign of 1 over x function had infinitely many oscillations of the same amplitude. Here the amplitudes are getting smaller because you're multiplying by x, which does make the amplitudes get smaller. But if you zoom in further and further toward the origin, it never looks more and more like a straight line. It always looks crazy. So that's not differentiable. It doesn't look more and more like a straight line. On the other hand, if I multiply x by x squared, or the sine of 1 over x by x squared, 
instead of x. Watch what happens with this one. It's also got infinitely many decaying oscillations as you approach zero. It's hard to tell that there's infinitely many there, but there are. However, they get so small in their amplitudes that the graph does look more and more like a straight line eventually. The oscillations are actually still there, you just can't see them anymore. They're so small you can't see them anymore. And that's good enough to say the function is differential at zero. It is the most linear. There's oscillations there, but they're so small you can't see them. And they get even smaller and smaller as you zoom in closer and closer. This one is similar, except I added an x out in front to make it slanted. Here I have infinitely many oscillations as well. So the oscillations are not about well, x-axis. But they get so small that eventually it looks more and more straight. It is a little bit. Okay. So that's the intuition of local linearity. And I also have the definition in the PowerPoint. Let's now talk about calculus without limits. also called infinitesimal calculus. And realize as I start to talk about this that it's actually related to local linearity. So this is just another point of view of the same subject of local linearity, of differentiability. Word of warning, calculus sans limits again sans means without. This is not rigorous. This is not rigorous, precise math that I'm about to show you. In fact, you may even be tempted to call it imaginary math if that word imaginary didn't have some other meaning in math. Square root of negative one. We're going to be using our imaginations here. This is the way Newton and Leibniz thought. Okay? They lived in the 1600s, early 1700s. They thought in the way that we're about to talk about. But people made fun of them for it. Even though they got good results, for example, Newton being able to predict the motion of the planets from his calculus and from physics. They got good results, but they were ridiculed to some degree for taking this approach. And mathematicians eventually wanted to fix it then. And that happened in the middle of the 1800s. Or absolutely dealt with stuff. I think it's worth talking about. Like I said, it's not in the textbook, but I do want you to know it. It's good, especially when you're learning how to apply calculus in science courses. Scientists, engineers think this way. They don't typically like limits so much. They leave that for the mathematicians. And they prefer to think intuitively. My problem with it when I was in your shoes is that I'd go to my math classes and my math teacher would talk about limits and then I'd go to my physics classes and my physics teachers would think in the way I'm going to show you here with infinitesimals. And I'm like, how do you know you can do that? I'd be asking my physics teacher. And they'd look at me and say, what are you, a mathematician? And I'd say, well, yeah. Oh, well, ask your mathematician professor. They'll tell you how, how it's rigorous or how to make it rigorous. They didn't care that it wasn't rigorous. So I just had to realize that and accept it for what it's worth. Suppose we're given a function like f of x equals x squared. Even though this is not a rigorous approach, it is worthwhile. It can even give you more intuition about calculus than your typical math major would know. Think about it. It's related to the three blue, one brown video. I'm going to give you another three blue, one brown video to watch. You should watch the first one if you haven't yet. Suppose we nudge x an infinitesimally tiny amount. Let x change a little. Call that infinitesimally tiny amount dx. Right? So here we're treating dx as one quantity, dx. Kind of like delta x is one quantity. 
But whereas delta x is an ordinary small number like 0.1 or 0.01 or 0.001, dx is infinitesimally tiny. Tinier than you could possibly imagine in a sense. Here's the problem. Do such numbers really exist? Are there numbers so small that they're smaller than any positive number? Are there numbers that are infinitesimally small? The answer is yes and no. No if you approach things in a standard way. Yes if you approach things in a non-standard way. You actually can make this rigorous with something called non-standard analysis. But a big word of warning here, I did look in the library for a book on non-standard analysis once, and I found one. I took it off the shelf, excited to see what was in it. I opened up the first page, looked at it, looked at a couple other pages, I put it back on the shelf. It was super duper hard looking, okay? Non-standard analysis. The rigorous approach to what I'm about to show you. The intuitive approach is not so hard. It's just difficult to make it rigorous. There is no smallest positive number, for example, real number, because I can always divide that positive real number by two, for example, and get a smaller positive real number. Right? There's no smallest positive real number. 10 to the negative 100 power is not the smallest positive real number, because, for example, I can divide it by two. Or I can consider 10 to the negative 200, or 10 to the negative million, or 10 to the negative Google. I can always make smaller and smaller positive numbers. So this idea of an infinitesimally tiny amount is only in our imaginations. If I do that living, how much will y change for this function? I suppose it should change an infinitesimally tiny amount as well. But can we somehow quantify that? It seems kind of ridiculous, but can we? Here's the graph of the function. I'm at some particular value of x, and I'm nudging x a tiny, tiny amount. I will actually draw a finite drawing here of the amount. This distance here is dx. The distance between this point right there and this point right there. But imagine that's super duper small. Y is going to change there as well, but evidently by a super duper small amount. So if it, if it changes by an infinitesimally tiny amount, how can you possibly quantify it? Well, just keep pushing forward. Do this calculation. Call it dy for an infinitesimally tiny change in y. So that would be f of the point on the right, x plus dx, minus f of x. That's the change in f, change in y. Plug those expressions into the formula for f of x. f of x is x squared, so I've got to take x plus dx and square it. Minus f of x, that's minus x squared. This should feel very familiar. We're used to doing this thing with either delta x or h instead of dx. Expand this out. Foil it, x squared plus 2x times dx plus dx squared. And here we come to our question, should I put parentheses around the dx squared or should I write it as d squared times x squared? No, I'll just leave it like that, that's fine. We're a little lazy here. This does represent the one quantity dx squared. Subtract x squared, the x squared's cancel, leaving you with this. Hmm, what do I do with that now? I guess that's a quantification on how much dy changed, how much y changed by this infinitesimally tiny amount of dy. We're going to do a simplification now. The simplification is based on this line of reasoning. If dx is infinitesimally small, then how small must dx squared be? If dx were, say, 10 to the negative 100 power, 
1 over Google. dx squared would be 10 to the negative 200 power. A Google times smaller than that. And again, a Google is more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. Of course, I can get more extreme. Like that, too. So dx is infinitesimally small, and dx squared must be unspeakably small? I just made that up. Does that make sense? If dx is infinitesimally small, dx squared must be unspeakably small, or unimaginably small, or something. So maybe it can be safely ignored. And that's what we do. We ignore the dx squared. And we write dy equals 2x dx. We ignore the dx squared. Hmm. dy equals 2x times dx. Divide both sides by dx. dy dx is 2x. Hey, that's the derivative of x squared. Cool. But I didn't use the power rule here. I derived it informally. Is that a coincidence? Will we always get the derivative? Let's try another example. How about y equals x cubed? Let's not bother with the function of I purposely avoided putting in f of x. What is dy? If x changes by an infinitesimal amount dx, what's the corresponding infinitesimal change in y? It would be, okay, well, f of x plus dx minus f of x, that would be the output of the function at x plus dx minus the output of the function at x. Got to cube this. Binomial theorem, x cubed plus 3x squared times dx plus 3x times dx squared plus dx cubed minus x cubed. Cancel the x cubed. Write 3x squared dx plus 3x dx squared plus dx cubed. dx is infinitesimally small. Dx squared must be unspeakably small. Dx cubed must be super duper unspeakably small. If I can ignore dx squared, I can certainly ignore dx cubed. Let's say this equals, in fact, 3x squared dx. I'm not even going to put an approximate equal here. I'm going to say equals. Hey, dy equals 3x squared dx. Divide both sides by dx. Dy dx equals 3x squared. That worked. I already knew the answer would be that. It worked. And you can try it for x to the fourth and x to the fifth and x to the sixth, and then you probably run out of endurance. And the same kind of thing would happen. Does it work with other functions? Yeah, though its application is sometimes more difficult. Let's try y equals sine of x, actually. Time, two minutes, maybe? One minute. Five. dy would be sine of x plus dx minus sine of x. What rule do I do with that? I use a trigonometric identity for the sign of a sum, which I typically forget, and most people, other people forget as well. Wikipedia, or maybe a Wolfram Alpha. Oops, Alphas. Wolfram Alpha, what is sine of A plus B? Alternate form. 
There you go. Ah, oh, oh, there it is. Sine A cos B plus cos A cos B. Hang with me here, just give me 30 seconds. What's A? It's X. What's B? It's DX. is so tiny it goes away. And it turns out that this is essentially one. Oh, okay. Oh no, it doesn't, it doesn't go away. It turns out this is essentially dx. This cosine dx is essentially one. This cancels with this. You're left with cosine x dx. I didn't fully explain that. We'll talk about it more on Friday. The answer is cosine x. Thank you.